Hello, this is Julia Davis of the Yoga Teachers Forum, and I'm here today with Carl Hargreaves. And Carl's going to be joining us um, on our Wednesday Forum in July to talk about yoga therapy. And I just thought I would start today, Carl, just to find out where your yoga journey began. Where did you start practicing yoga? Oh, wow. Okay, so I had an uncle called Edwin Coppard who passed away recently, sadly, but um, he was an amazing person. He taught me to meditate when I was about four years old. So that was um, my first introduction to yoga. And um, we did transcendental meditation together. He, he um, was really into transcendental meditation to the extent that he got married in a hot air balloon by the Maharishi himself. Wow. <laughs> So he's quite, a, quite an uncle. So yeah. I'm incredibly fortunate to have been introduced to yoga very young. And did, you said you were initiated into yoga at the age of four. Was it a continual process from then or were there breaks? You know, you kind of like four to six, yeah. you had a little yeah. fun with yoga. Yeah. And then... yeah. <laughs> to be honest, there were massive breaks because Edwin was living in Canada and uh, my parents, do you remember Freddie Laker? And he started the cheap internet in transatlantic flights. So yes. Yes. Around about the 70s, um, we were able to fly and my mother's family were all in Canada. So we literally went out every summer for the whole of the time because we lived with her family and the flights were cheap and either that or they would come to us. So every summer from the age of four till I guess 15 or something, maybe there were a couple of summers that we didn't but Edwin we would see regularly and whenever we were with him he would be meditating three or four times a day so we would all just do that together sort of 20 minutes in the morning 20 minutes before lunch 20 minutes before dinner 20 minutes before bed when he was around he wasn't around the whole holiday but when he was around so it was it was very intermittent and I when he wasn't around I wasn't practicing four times a day I was practicing like 10 minutes or something maybe because he'd said you've got to practice every day do a little bit so I wasn't you know I didn't have my own discipline until much later and where did yoga transform from being a meditation practice into something that was maybe more than a seated practice okay so um I was um doing meditation at various points as a kind of because it was something I enjoyed doing and I felt the benefits of it. So I would return to it as, as it was needed, as it were. Um, but then after university, I trained to be a contemporary dancer, which sounds like a kind of strange thing to do. That's but I ran, of, <laughs> I ran a couple of businesses at university and I ended up with some friends of mine. We ended up with a bit of money in the bank. Um, so I was able to spend a year sort of doing what I wanted to do. And what I decided I want to do was a dance training and then the money that I put aside for a year, I managed to make it last for about five years of, ton of dance training until I was good enough to get a job as a professional dancer. And during the time I was doing the dance training, um, I was meditating because my brain was full of new ideas and stuff to sort of settle that aspect of things. But also my body was an old body for a dancer and I was learning I'd done a lot of martial arts before, so that's this kind of link with yoga as well, because the end goal of martial arts and yoga is the same. They, they all culminate in meditation and, you know, some kind of self-realisation or, you know, various labels for that. Um, so I fancied that I could be a dancer based on the martial arts that I'd done. I was like, oh, I can jump high, I can do kicks and high legs and things. So, and I discovered quite quickly that I couldn't and I needed to do a training. So I did this training and to cut a long story short, my body was aching and I found myself doing a lot of stretching. And I picked up Mr. Iyengar's book at one point, Light on Yoga, and I was like, oh, I'm doing that stretch and I'm doing that. Oh, look, I do that and I do this. I'm pretty much doing everything that's in this book. and Oh, look, and then they meditate at the end of it. <laughs> and the only thing that I had, and, and in the between was the breathing. I was like, oh, I did breathing in martial arts. That was kind of a fairly important part of martial arts training was breathing. Yeah. And it looks like yoga has taken breathing even further. So I must, um, so I was on a dance course and there was a teacher called Giovanni Felicioni on the course, yeah. who's a 
um, in inverted column, a Scaravelli teacher. Okay. He said, oh, I'm a yoga teacher, and he was a dancer. We did the course together. It was a Butto body weather course with Kati Rulo. Yeah. Who's, so, and body weather is like yoga, actually. You do this very slow movement. So there's so many links. Yoga, mm-hmm. I believe yoga is um, cropping up all over the place. You know, like anything you do with total focus is yoga. Um, I discovered recently that there's African yoga. So like, of course there's African yoga because people in Africa sat and observed their body and observed the mind and they came up with exactly the same conclusions that the Indians did. So they've got yoga in Africa. So um, it's cropping up everywhere. So for me, I sort of discovered yoga myself, realized, oh look, some other people have put in some work on this. I should really learn from them. So uh, I started doing classes with Giovanni, and he's an amazing teacher, beautiful teacher, lovely person, very, um, and he was doing, linked with the Worldwide Community for Christian Meditation, Mm -hmm. and I ended up living with them actually for a while. They're very lovely, generous people, and exploring the mystical side of Christianity, and possibly more ancient practices. So people were doing yoga in the Middle East. The Desert, the desert Fathers apparently were doing a kind of meditation and silent practice and so on, these early Christians. So I discovered this kind of reconnection with the bodywork through Giovanni, the Scaravelli yoga, and then started going to loads of other teachers within that tradition, like um, Sophie Hoare and... Um, Gosh, I can't remember the names now, but, but um, really lovely teachers. Um, oh, gosh. Anyway, it will come back to me in a minute. Um, yeah. Wow. Diane, oh, um, yes. I love asking this question because you can know someone for a while as a yoga teacher and maybe never even have asked the question where it all began. And then when you find out where it all began, just I get kind of like tingles. Um, and I just love that um, you came from a place where you had the opportunity to do what you wanted to do. And what you wanted to do was explore movement through dance and then dance took you to yoga. But you already had the seeds of yoga in the meditation practice you began as a four-year-old. And the whole connection to, um, I guess it's spirituality, but it's amazing how those people who come to a connection to the earth and a love of um, nature and our own bodies in the world through a named faith, can also make those same connections as well. So that's just beautiful. There's so much richness in that. And I'm a big fan of um, the Scaravelli style or the whole, whole, the freedom of movement that there can be in yoga. So that's a beautiful um, introduction to your life as a yoga practitioner. Um, And then just following on from that, it would be lovely to find out how you segued from being somebody who was exploring dance and movement and yoga for your own personal love and joy of it to someone who chose to share yoga with a wider community um, and eventually as a therapist. Okay, so that's Giovanni's fault. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) He said at some point I'd been studying yoga with him, which meant going once a week to a group class for about five years. And this was about 1995. And he said, you know, the deal is, once I've taught you all this stuff, you have to pass it on. It's not just for you, it's for everybody. So I was like, oh, really? You know, I sort of didn't particularly have any interest in teaching yoga whatsoever. I didn't think I could teach yoga particularly. Um, but he sort of inspired me. So I thought, okay, you know, he's my teacher. He's told me I should start teaching. So I'm going to do the minimum. I did one group a week. I had a friend who had an art gallery in Northcote Road in Clapham. And she gave me her space, beautiful space, you know, white walls. The art was different every couple of months, uh, wooden floor. And she just created a group for me out of all her mates. So she just said, I've got this yoga teacher at my space. You know, so all her friends, mostly um, sort of, uh, I guess it was mostly late 20-something young women. And I was a bit younger, possibly, was I? No, I was about the same age, maybe... Yeah, I think about the same age. Gosh, they'd be insulted to think I thought I was younger. Um, um, 
I, I can't remember too much. Um, but yeah, that, so I started teaching class once a week and I did that for a number of years. And then um, a friend opened a yoga studio in Bethnal Green called Yoga Space E2. And she was looking for yoga teachers. And at the time I was between dance jobs. And I thought, well, actually she was offering me not full time, but almost like half time employment, you know, a couple of classes here, a couple of classes there covering. So I sort of fell into this job for her. And then I also, um, I also was working on helping her open it up. Like, so I ended up doing quite a lot of, uh, well, doing and organizing building work. So we sanded floors and painted and, um, so I had a that was one of my little businesses that when I was a dancer in between jobs and when I was a student was having a little sort of light building company. We just did sort of like painting garden fences or sanding floors or building desks and stuff. Anyway, I digress. So I got, yeah, I started getting more and more work as a yoga teacher, again, without really asking for it because I wanted to be free to do the, um, the dance work which was really my passion um and uh, so what happened uh so how did that move along from teaching class i mean it sounds like a beautiful organic process you went from teaching one class to yeah. the then I had colleague the, in a studio right. that they loved and then yeah. from that how did it like change from mm. teaching general classes to offering yoga on a much more therapeutic basis on a, you know kind of a, a specifically naming the yeah. fact that it was for a therapeutic benefit so um i think as you you know we had this conversation a while ago all yoga is therapeutic you know you can't there's no such thing really as yoga therapy it's an artificial category there are some qualifications that are attached to that idea of yoga therapy but Every experienced yoga teacher and, and even the most inexperienced yoga teacher is doing therapeutic yoga. So I don't really recognize, uh, you know, a shift from one to the other. It was always therapeutic. Um, yeah. But I had a sort of, um, I started to feel when I was working at Yoga Space E2, I was still smoking the odd roll up. And Jenny, who was a real purist, and she'd sort of smell it on me and say, Carl, you can't smoke. You know, and I was like, oh, maybe I'm not a real yogi. Am I, am I actually doing this properly? And so I started inquiring into, well, what am I doing? You know, do I actually, am I, a, you know, I'm not trained. I don't have a teaching qualification. What was I thinking to start teaching? <laughs> so, uh, so actually, sorry, this process happened a bit before I worked for Jenny. Um, so I, when I was teaching my one class a week, I started to feel responsible and I got, and one of the people in the class told me she was pregnant and then I was like, oh shit, now I have to actually find out about not hurting this woman's child, unborn child. So then I very sort of quickly signed up for one of these one month courses uh, and I did this course with, um, uh, with Narayani who was recommended by my cousin, who's also into yoga, um, from my other side of my family. So all the family is into yoga. And my, my cousin's a shiatsu practitioner, Chinese medicine and acupuncturist, um, very, very excellent body worker and so on. So she said, oh, there's this woman called Narayani who used to be the demonstrator and sort of number one student of Vishnu Devananda. Um, you know, the Shivananda lineage. Mm. And so I thought, oh, okay, you know, it's not, I don't know anything about Shivananda. It doesn't, you know, so I just jumped into this, I think it was like a five week intensive full, full time course. Wow. And they gave me my qualification at the end. And I thought, actually, I didn't really learn anything on this course. I learned some chants and things, but I already knew. So I had confidence then that I ticked off that I knew some stuff. But then I was like, but really, I mean, can I be a yoga teacher in five weeks? So then I did another short course with Godfrey Devereaux, who was teaching this dynamic yoga, which is sort of like different again mm. from Saravelli, different from Shivananda. So I was still concerned that I don't know enough about yoga to teach properly. So I did his dynamic course, and that was another four-week intensive or five-week 
full time in Ibiza, amazing, lovely. <laughs> and then with those qualifications, I think, um, I felt better qualified. Oh, okay, I have to rewind. Sorry, because we haven't prepared these questions. I, I started inquiring quite early on, after about the five year point with Giovanni, how does he know what he knows, right? Who was the teacher of Banda Scaravelli? So Ayenga was one of her teachers and Desika Char was another one. And who were their teachers? It turns out that was Krishnamacharya. So I kind of started swimming upstream towards the source of what I was learning. Yeah. And it opened up a lot more possibilities. I realized that actually Vanda is a genius, but she only taught, if you like, a fraction of what was available within the tradition. Similarly with Patabi Joyce, and you know, I don't want to be disrespectful to anybody, but Krishnamacharya had such an incredible broad understanding and the tradition is so rich. Yeah. And so I started learning a little bit more and I got myself, my wife had a yoga teacher called Sylviane Giannina, who's a, what used to be called a Vini yoga teacher. Yeah. And uh, so I started going to her. So I think I'd been seeing her for about seven years yeah. One to one. Wow. Uh, and about halfway through the process with her, I did these teacher trainings. And I started doing, she taught teacher training as well within the Vini Yoga tradition, but in, a, in the French style with some modular sort of bits. So she got a group of yoga teachers together. So once I started teaching, then I got into her yoga teachers group and she taught these modules around teacher training. So so I picked up from these different short courses and much more actually from Sylviane at these workshops. Mm -hmm. But I didn't get all the modules and she was doing it sort of informally in England. It wasn't part of the French Vini Yoga system. So yeah. then I signed up and she left the country and went to live in France. Yeah. So I then no longer had a one-to-one -one yoga teacher after seven years with her. I then switched to uh, various running around to various people and trying people out and I found Paul Harvey who seemed to be the best qualified guy in within that tradition in the UK because he'd spent 25 years with Desika Char and spent time with Krishnamacharya so then I signed up for his teacher training course um, but first you had to do a foundation in Vini Yoga so I studied with Dave Charlton and Ranji Roy foundation stage one stage two stage three you had to already have done four years with your one-to-one -one teacher, so I had that ticked off. And it took each of these courses, the stage where they were all a year with week of weekends. So after the four years of preparatory work, then I got onto Paul Harvey's teacher training course, which was a four, was it the three or the four-year course? I think it was a four year or a three. Anyway, it was a proper long course. Yeah. At the end of which I did actually finally feel like I knew a bit about what I was doing. I, you know, I, I love that you've told this story because um, along the line of this story, you've peppered the conversation with some of the most well-known and well-loved and well-respected yoga teachers that are known to the Western world. Um, You've also shown in the conversation that there may have been, or there was clearly a strong wish to feel that you were in a place where you could share from a place of deep knowledge, strength, understanding and personal practice. Well, I started to feel afraid that I was going to hurt somebody. And the more I did yoga, the more I realised actually how much responsibility I had for people. And like, yeah. what the hell was I doing? teaching you know with all this confidence and and diplomas that were you know frankly given very easily to people there were yeah. people who received diplomas who i thought oh hang on they don't know much i wouldn't <laughs> want to put anybody i particularly cared about in a group with you know without naming anybody but i think we all start off like that and then i look back at myself and think christ that was me yeah i, I didn't really know what i was doing um yeah. and so that's probably me now. So I should actually keep studying and learn. Yeah, and, and it's kind of not a should. I think when we, when we love our practice as much as we do, we'll never come to a point where we think, oh, yeah, I'm, I know it. <laughs> and we'll always have those moments in our 
lives when we question whether we're okay to be what we're do, do, be doing what we're doing. But also, we'll know that somewhere deep down there, there's, you know, there was a reason, there was like a thread to how you came to teach. And when there's a thread to how we come to teach, it's like we're meant to be in the room with those people and we're meant to be sharing what we're sharing. And that just brings to mind um, my Sanskrit teacher, Lucy Crisfield, and she said the first class that she ever stepped into was a hot yoga class. It was literally one of those hot rooms where they did a vinyasa flow fast thing. And then from that, somehow, she came to work with one of the most knowledgeable Sanskrit scholars India has alive today and shares a deep, beautiful Sanskrit practice. And so, you know, maybe that person who ran that hot yoga class don't have no idea who it was. They brought her, they brought someone like her into yoga. So who knows? who was on the map with you and, and how they benefited and how their families and friends and people around them benefited from the newbie Carl that was teaching in a really lovely um, art gallery all those years ago. To some extent, you don't need to, I mean, that one way of looking at it is that I was worried, I didn't know anything. And the other, I mean, there's so many perspectives on this. Another is that um, you only need to know a tiny fraction more than the person you're teaching. It's a bit like being a mountaineer. You just have to be, a few yards ahead and sometimes that's better than the teacher who's at the top of the mountain who you're he's so far from your experience as a beginner that they maybe have forgotten what it's like to um so i think there's a there's also a place for people with you know very poor qualifications but loads of confidence who are just a little bit ahead on their journey of the other people that they're guiding mm -hmm. there is a place for that as well i mean that yoga is so uh, accommodating to everybody I think there's a but ultimately you know I do think we should learn as much as possible and be as safe as we can I started learning about the philosophy of yoga you know and the ahimsa being the number one mm. starting point in just the to say what ahimsa means to you just for those people who might not know so ahimsa is is harm and so ahimsa is non-harming so we harm all the time you know we're doing some harm now we're burning some fossil fuels to have this conversation but hopefully we minimize we do as little harm as possible it's impossible not to harm right i probably stepped on an insect on my way here i was gardening i definitely killed a snail by accident <laughs> i put a pot down and there was a crunch so everything you do creates harm right but we try to do as little harm as possible um so you know, even not doing is harming because you should, you could have been doing something that prevented harm. So, and so that started to sink in that idea of seeing the world in terms of harm and trying to minimize the harm. Suddenly I need to know because otherwise I could harm my students. And it says uh, in the Dhatu, the, the root of the word himsa, it says only by harming is harming known. Speaking of your Sanskrit person, mm. she would, presumably look up the Dhatu of Sanskrit words and mm. Sanskrit is just like this incredible encyclopedia of spiritual knowledge. Mm. Every Dhatu is a teaching. So the Dhatu on Himsa is that only by harming is harming known. So we can't predict actually, we could set out with amazing intentions and do incredible amounts of harm. So we have to do things to find out what the harm is in doing them. Mm. And um, so the, the knowledge of experience through action is, is um, vital there. I'm going to thread back to yeah. the theme of the session that you'll be running on the 17th oh, of okay. yeah. July, um, yeah. yoga therapy. And I just wanted to ask you, first of all, if you like, could imagine a world in, you know, the, the world that we'd want to be in, what would yoga therapy look like? Maybe in the UK, because we're, we are in the UK, what would yoga therapy look like um, in the UK, in your kind of dream world? Um, so I, I'm immediately sort of suspicious of dream worlds. You know, I'd like to kind of just accept this one. Can I do that? Can I sort of yeah, say, look, this one. this one is perfect as it is, but then I want to work within this one towards a goal. And I guess as a yogi, I'm, I don't, I want to be careful about 
imagining my dream world because um, then I might not be connected so much with this one. And so to get to my dream world, I have to really accept my world right here. And I think there's some really, so to answer the question without sort of being sort of pedantic and, uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, I think there's some amazing things going on at the moment with Extinction Rebellion, who I've recently come into contact with. So I feel like there's a deep shift going on and they've incorporated some therapeutic yoga practices into their activism. So people who are, you know, on the media being shown as sort of irritating flies in the sort of capitalist ointment and preventing poor people from going to work. Well, that, what's actually happening is often they're glued to things and they're meditating and other people are very mindfully supporting them and giving offerings of food and other kinds of support. And one of the supports is yoga and meditation. And so I think that's an example of how I would like to see yoga therapy integrating itself into lots of things, activities in the world. In that case, it's sort of social activism to prevent the end of the world by global warming, which seems a good idea, especially in the context we've just been talking about non-harming. Mm -hmm. And so yoga therapy, at some point, the NHS are gonna wake up fairly soon and say, you know what, we can save billions because somebody who does yoga will never go to hospital. They just won't get ill unless they have an accident. And you know what, if they're doing a lot of awareness training, they won't have an accident because they'll be aware of their surroundings. So they'll be less likely to fall down the stairs or crash their car. In fact, they'll probably be in a car less often if they're doing yoga. So the risk of car crash is reduced, not only by increasing awareness, but by decreasing car use. You know, they'll change their diet they'll, and so on. So there's so I think we could end up seeing enormous savings to the NHS through yoga being offered more and more as an alternative to um, less um, uh, effective ma treatments. And the only drawback of yoga is that people have to do it, right? It's easier to take a pill or have a surgery done to you because you are very passive in that case. Whereas with yoga, you have to become proactive and actually knuckle down and, and get a discipline and do the practice to, to receive the benefits. So I think, yeah, yoga, a couple of big things, yoga into the world of activism and politics. So, you know, the, the MPs, instead of sort of calling each other names and oh, less of that and more meditating in the chamber, maybe before a session, mm -hmm. which is actually what XR do sometimes. They have a little meditation in the, it's a very different thing. It's not, I was ex sort of um, so surprised because it didn't feel like the, your usual political sort of setup. It was not divisive, it was supportive. People talked about their feelings. Um, and so I'd like to see politics done a bit more like that with more yoga seeping in. And also, I mean, yoga is seeping into companies, into businesses. If you have yoga classes, you're more likely to retain your staff. Your staff aren't going to be off sick with, you know, let's just take one thing back issues. They do a, one yoga class a week. They're less likely to miss work for um, lower back pain, which is the cause of a lot of lost days. So this kind of thing. Okay, I think that's the... Um, I'm talking a bit much, aren't I, yeah, so, so Just to clarify, because we're going to come to a close. Um, it, we're going to re I'm really looking forward to the session with you on the 17th of July. And mm -hmm. in amongst that session, we can touch on yoga and politics, yoga and business, yoga and NHS, and all of those things. And maybe within that, we might have some experience, do some practice as yeah, well. Absolutely, as absolutely. It has to be practical, otherwise it's just you know, we're in our heads and... Yeah, lovely. There was one big uh, sort of thing that I missed out of my um, sort of his history of my yoga practice. Yeah. Because I got to a certain point with, um, uh, with the traditional kind of yoga that I was learning, that, that, that which was packaged as yoga, and it didn't seem very strong on the meditation side. I felt like I'd learned more about meditation from my uncle. So I started looking into the philosophy via Advaita Vedanta and these teachers um, like 
Tony Moo and Satchananda and um, who else did I see? John de Reuter, who doesn't call himself an Advaitin, but is talking about, um, about being, about awareness. And I found that those people, and, and there's a whole sort of satsang circuit in London, people who make the claim, some of them, that they, Tony Parsons, another one, that they are, they had a, a, a moment of enlightenment that they've sort of retained and they want to share that with other people. So I went on the satsang circuit for quite a while and I ended up having a sort of uh, sense of understanding through with a teacher called Satyananda, who is a beautiful, wonderful person who runs retreats. He's this weekend in Bournemouth, actually. He's been, he's probably just come out of a silent retreat. Mm. Uh, they had a, they had five days of silent retreat in Bournemouth. And I actually met my wife on a 10 day silent retreat of Satchananda's and uh, his ex-girlfriend introduced me to my wife. Uh, and we ended up going on a road trip after the um, satsang. And uh, the rest is history, as they say. I now have two children, wonderful children, who are a massive, the most important part of my life, I suppose. Wonderful. So there's so much that's rich there. We've learned so much about your background, how you came to yoga, the connection to meditation and dance. And um, I just want to thank you, Carl, very much for your time this afternoon. Yeah. And I'm really looking forward to uh, spending time with you on the 17th of July. Thank you so much.